People might say I, I'm, I'm a little alarmist when I mention a potential civil war. The civil war. There may be a civil war. Civil war. The American civil war. Civil war. You do know there's a civil war, right? We are in a cold civil war. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. NerdGerotic.com. After some of the most divisive years in Hollywood, which certainly played its part in exacerbating some of the most divisive years in America, in yet another divisive year with another contentious election, and just a month after the release of the potentially divisive American Society of Magical Negroes. In this case, it turns out it wasn't because everybody hated it. Still, in this contentious year with a divisive election, Hollywood thought it was a good idea to release a movie about an American Civil War, and why not? Civil War. That's right, Tim, you got your movie. No, not that Civil War this civil war and up front i want to give credit to british writer and director alex garland for having the balls to take something like this on and when i saw critics like movie bob and grace randolph come out against civil war i started to look forward to it then i saw it and unfortunately when alex garland went out to make this film he left his balls at home there are two types of balls there are big brave balls and there are little mincy balls. The trailer completely misrepresents what this film is really about. It's a love letter to an idealistic form of journalism that may have existed in the past, but it certainly doesn't exist now. Civil War. Tries to be objective and or politically ambiguous, and it could have been a lot worse. Unfortunately, it devolves into Hollywood progressive wish fulfillment. I always think what's the Achilles heel of the right is that they're cruel in a sense. Uh, they can act in a way that's cruel. And the Achilles heel of the left is that they're smug and, and they, they make things into moral, ethical positions. I'm left wing. My politics yeah, we are talked left about that wing. Earlier, yeah. Yeah. I'm in some respects picking a fight. And when you pick a fight, then you can expect the people you're picking a fight with to aggress back at you. I honestly don't really care. I, part of the aggression is, yeah, bring it on, mm -hmm. idiots. Mm -hmm. You know, bring it on, morons. But ultimately, it's not the politics that hurt this film. It's the story, or the lack there of it, and the lack of any compelling characters. And its worst crime is it's boring. Civil War. It's essentially about a dystopian future where we follow four journalists on an odyssey through war-torn America on their way to get the first interview with the president in 14 months. In this cautionary tale, what if scenario or alternate universe i really don't know there are three separatist factions there's the new people's army which is the northern states there's the florida alliance and then there's california and texas who are the western alliance who are the only ones engaging with the loyalist states this film takes place towards the end of the civil war and the loyalist states are losing so our four heroic journalists must race against time to get to the president before the western forces attack washington dc on the 4th of july now in a movie without a lot of specifics it is specifically stated that the administration sees journalists as enemy combatants and if they enter washington Washington, D.C., they're shot on sight. They even mention in the film that this is somewhat of a suicide mission, so you would think that our four heroic journalists would have some sort of deal with the administration or plan for this interview. Nope, they're just winging it. Our main characters are Joel. No, not that Joel. This Joel, played by dollar store Pedro Pascal, who's a bit of a reckless adrenaline junkie who plays a small part in getting some people killed later on in the film and the longtime partner of Kirsten Dunst's character. Then there's Sammy, quite frankly, the best thing in this movie, played by Stephen McKinley Henderson, who plays the sage old wise man who works for what's left of the New York Times and is only along for the ride to get as far as the Carolinas to cover their skirmish with the Florida Alliance. This brings us to the main character played by the embattled Kirsten Dunst, which did prepare her for this film because apparently all the other films she worked on, she was horribly abused, specifically on the set of Spider-Man, where she was called Girly Girl. I'm sure that was the motivation for Kirsten Dunst to take the role of legendary war photographer Lee, who was haunted by seeing war and death around the world, and now she has to deal with it at home. Quick aside, What's Lee's most famous photograph? Well, it's the picture of the Antifa massacre. Oh, you got me shitting me. 
Then there's our fourth character, Jessie, who idolizes the legendary Lee, somehow made it to New York by herself through war-torn America. And despite the fact that she looks 12, she's 23 in the film, she flirts with Joel to get a ride with our heroic journalists. And for the rest of the film, she generally annoys the audience and gets people killed. I'm sorry for jamming my way into your ride, okay? I know you're really angry about it, and I know you think I don't know shit, but I'm not angry about that, Jesse. I didn't take a single photo. I didn't even remember. I had cameras on me. Like, oh my god. Like, like why didn't I just tell him not to- Shut, shut up! up! Shut up! I just want- Shut okay. the- I guess at this point we can talk about Nick Offerman's The President who's only in the very beginning and the very end of this film. What do we know about him? Not much. First off, he's totally not Donald Trump. They're the same picture. He's given himself a third term, which is bad. He's disbanded the FBI, which isn't so bad. And to show their objectivity, they mentioned that he's ordered airstrikes against American citizens, which is a shot at Obama. And no, we don't know how the Civil War started. We don't generally know how it's going other than it's ending between the Western forces and the Loyalist states. We know the interior Loyalist states have been vaporized, so there is no straight shot from New York to Washington, D.C., which turns a roughly 200 mile journey into a almost thousand mile journey that takes days for our four hero journalists. Again, this film is an odyssey that can be compared to dozens of other films like Apocalypse Now. Our group of trustworthy, somewhat idealistic, but objective journalists, essentially our group of four unicorns, travels through the United States coming across random events, being dropped in the middle of them, sometimes with no resolution. When our trusty journalists stop to get some fuel, they find that the people running the gas station are torturing looters in the car wash. In another scenario, there's a random raid in a random building with plain clothed armed people versus uniformed armed people. There's the surreal sniper scene where apparently some homeowner is trying to lure out people with Christmas decorations in July, where we think the homeowner was killed by some other snipers who have nail polish and dyed hair. And the only reason we know is because they said so. They didn't show it. And the penultimate scenario before they get to go observe the final boss battle is with Jesse Plemons that everyone's seen in the trailer, which at the very least launched a meme. This scenario is set up after our four trusty, heroic, objective journalists who are all traveling together, which I have to add is about as likely to happen as you being struck by lightning and surviving on your way to collect your lottery winnings that you didn't play. Anyway, they run into a couple of other journalists on the road that they know who are obvious red shirts. They end up at Jesse Plemons' house, who's dumping a dump truck load of dead bodies into a giant pit, along with a couple of mute friends who don't say a line in the film. I'm guessing all of those dead bodies weren't the right kind of American because when Jesse asks them where they're from, when everyone says they're from America, he doesn't kill them. Look, look, I'm American. I think I'll use my credit card. Do you guys have anything non-dairy? <laughs> so when this dumbass says he's from Hong Kong, he gets shot dead. And therein lies the biggest problem with civil war. It's not the premise. It's not even the politics. It's the characters and the stupid decisions they make. And it doesn't help that none of them, save for one, are likable. So after being saved from Jesse Plemons and his mute partners by Sammy, who get shot, they just throw him in the back seat and let him die. And no, they don't even look at the wound. They don't even break out a Band-Aid. And the film ends with Lee, Joel, and Jesse being embedded with the Western forces as they make their final raid on Washington, DC. And time is running out because the Western forces have been ordered to execute the president on site. And despite some dodgy CGI, I thought this was the best part of the film. The battle was pretty good up until the end. Now, this movie is Lee's story. Again, she is a war photographer, not a videographer. So this is some idealized form of journalism in some alternate reality where people still care about still photography. And throughout the film, she's having an existential crisis. There is a specific point where she mentions that you need to remain objective, not get involved. Our job as journalists is to take a picture, write the story, and let the people decide. But clearly all the not getting involved has gotten to her and she freaks out at the end. But ultimately, she pulls it together to save Jesse, who's running out in the middle of hallways during the raid, getting in everybody's way, somehow not getting killed because she had obvious plot armor. And Lee ends up getting shot as Jesse takes pictures of her as she dies and then moves on.
What the f***? After the Western forces killed the press secretary who wanted to negotiate, they go in with Joel and Jesse and they find the president under his desk, begging for his life right before they execute him. And that's where the movie ends. Jesse gets her historic picture, although I'm not sure how historic it's gonna be considering there's a giant power vacuum and there's multiple factions still fighting each other. In the end, Civil War leaves you with a lot more questions than answers. And yes, I understand this film was made to create conversations, but it's really better for curing insomnia. Now, there is some good. The acting across the board is solid. There were some good action scenes, particularly at the end. There were some good music choices and some really odd ones considering the scenes. And some of the directing was good. And as far as the bad is concerned, well, the pacing and Alex Garland just left too much open to interpretation. No, I don't don't need to know how the Civil War started, and I don't need everything explained to me, but I did need to know a little bit more about this world. Because it felt like for the first two-thirds of Civil War, we were following the most unlikable people in the most uninteresting part of it. Still, while I'm not sure this film will create conversations, as I said earlier, it's definitely created some questions. What's the resource situation? In the beginning of the movie, there's almost a riot over a water truck until a suicide bomber from the Loyalist states blows it up. Yet in New York, there's still power and the internet. Wait a minute, an American blue city prioritizing the internet over water? That kind of checks out. What was the Antifa massacre? Was our heroic photojournalist Lee famous for taking pictures of the 2020 Summer of Love? Why did Joel and his plucky journalist pals drive into an obvious trap with the sniper? It's not like the guy with his head blown off in the middle of the Christmas decorations gave it away. <laughs> Why did this guy think that smoke bomb gave him enough cover to not get shot? <laughs> After Jesse Plemons' character asked everyone what kind of American they were and they all answered what part of America they were from, why in the hell did Joel's friend Tony, after clearly noticing that they didn't get shot, say he was from Hong Kong and then he got shot? <laughs> Why would warring factions, including one from Texas in America that's devolved into a civil war, trust the press from the loyalist states? And why in the hell would you let the press run around with you in a firefight in the White House? And why would a president who's hunkered down in the White House be found hiding under his desk instead of, I don't know, in a bunker? And the answer to a lot of these questions exemplified with them blowing up the Lincoln Memorial symbolism over story. I think the best explanation of Civil War can be found in a response from Little Platoon to this tweet. The point of the film is to be ambiguous so the audience can find meaning on their own. That's art. Humans today lost the ability to imagine. They need to be spoon-fed. Derivative. That I love. I absolutely love. When it comes to Hollywood these days, particularly from Disney and Zack Snyder, I would agree with that sentiment. But in this case, with Civil War, I have to side with Little Platoon. And once again, credit to Alex Garland, who's hit or miss with me. He did try, but this one was a miss. I think this biased British director tried to be as unbiased as possible. The political ambiguity was there, but as many people have said in the past, he went after one side with a baseball bat and the other side with a feather. What's left of the New York Times says this, Civil War Review, we have met the enemy and it's us again. Well, if you're talking about the New York Times, I would agree. Unfortunately, they elaborate and of course the New York Times isn't going to miss an opportunity to mention that date in January. If the violence feels more intense than in a typical genre shoot 'em up which it really didn't, it's also because I think with Civil War, Garland has made the movie that's long been workshopped in American political discourse and in mass culture, and which entered wider circulation on January 6. The raw power of Garland's vision unquestionably owes much to the vivid scenes that beamed across the world that day. Except it really doesn't. Um, although it was written before January the 6th, there was something about January the 6th that it was a disgrace, right? It, right. it was various things, right. but one of the things was it was a disgrace and it provoked a feeling of uh, 
whatever is happening, this shouldn't be happening. This just has a has like a deep wrongness. About right. It. Rolling Stone, which is owned by Penske Media, who also owns The Hollywood Reporter, Deadline, and IndieWire, says Civil War imagines America's worst case scenario right around the corner. Alex Garland presents a USA at war with itself, in which ordinary citizens take up arms against one another and blood runs in the streets. No, it's not a documentary yet. And interestingly enough, this article's written by David Fear. And Rolling Stone thinks that Alex Garland didn't go hard enough on the politics, and I would agree with half of that sentiment. I didn't think Alex Garland went hard enough on the journalists. As Alex Garland previously stated, he wrote this prior to 2020. And maybe it's just a case of bad timing because we live in a different world now and maybe Alex Garland should have waited and rewrote the script until after COVID. Maybe Alex Garland should have explored a little bit more of what he says right here in Civil War. Obviously there's a problem. The problem comes partly from politicians deliberately attacking the press and it comes partly, I think, from social media. Um, and the nature of discourse that you get there. And it also comes from within media organizations that have very deliberately and consciously abandoned a role of journalism as something without bias. Now, you, it may be impossible to be without bias, but there is a sliding scale and institutions have chosen to go way down the sliding scale to a point they are essentially propaganda machines, not not really journalists anymore. Maybe an American should have taken a crack at this film because again, it's a great concept. I would love to see it, but quite frankly, I would believe Texas and California would unite in a civil war over there being a trustworthy corporate journalist. You can't exist as well as you do without doctors. And that's true with journalism as well. A, a free press protects the people against the excesses of government. It is a check and a balance on any and all governments. That's what a free press does. You can't take that away. And you can't, you shouldn't disrespect it. Hate to break this to you, Alex, but the reason journalists are being vilified is because they've earned it. And don't you find it interesting that the world is a dangerous place because the corporate press is trying to crush the independent free press? Civil war. Would have been far more interesting if they had gone into that even a little. Thankfully, there are still some good independent journalists out there. You just need to work a little harder to find them. And a growing number of people are starting to do that despite having to wade through the murky waters of information where sometimes the truth is called misinformation and sometimes lies are called the official version of the truth brought to you by authoritative state and corporate sources sponsored by Pfizer if you like what you heard please like share and subscribe if you didn't like what you heard I thank you for listening this long I will see you in the next video nerderotic.com please subscribe